So uh, today we're starting one of the great works of Western literature, which some of you I think may have read at one point uh, in some of your classes, and you may read again in some of your other classes, Plato's Republic. It's one of his longest works. We're not reading all of it. We're only reading four books, although um, books is kind of a strange thing to call chapters. Isn't it? Does anyone know why they call them books instead of chapters for these ancient texts? Anybody ever heard of this sort of thing? What did books look like before we had books that folded open? That, those are actually a, a relatively modern invention. Think back to like your Western Civ classes or, or Western history classes or world history classes. What did people write on first? Do you remember? Yeah. Scrolls? Exactly. Yeah, I mean, first they wrote on these, these clay tablets, but those are very inconvenient, aren't they, for carrying around. You can only look at one page at a time. Then they started using scrolls. And when you see a, a text and it says, you know, Republic and it's got ten books, what that literally means is there were ten scrolls. And your book was like a pouch that had these scrolls in it. And when you wanted to read, you know, chapter three, you'd get out the third scroll and scroll down, not in the computer sense, but in the ancient sense. And you'd actually read it like this. You'd be turning one while you're turning the other, and you'd, you'd look at it. And actually, all ancient books were that way until the invention of what we call the labellum, which is what we're used to, the, the books of pages of them. That was a, an innovation. We can always talk more about why they did that later on. Um, maybe I will tell you about that when we get to Epictetus and Stoics. Um, so book one is the first scroll, and why did they you know, stop at, at book one? Well, that's how much you could fit on a scroll. So it was a convenient unit of measure. Uh, you notice that book one isn't all about one single thing, though, right? There's a couple different discussions, and we're actually not going to look at all those discussions. We're going to look at two of the big ones, mainly, and we're going to skip all the background material of... I was going down to Piraeus, and then, you know, these guys caught up with me, and they started talking about horse races and, you know, torches and all that. We're going to skip all of that because that's, that's nice background information, but it's not really essential to, to what we're doing here. Um, if we're doing a Plato class, you know, just Plato the whole semester, we might talk in greater detail about that. Um, so... You know, with any dialogue, just like a play, you've got a cast of characters. And so far, what we've been doing is, you know, one, one character, Socrates, gets up, does a monologue, talks a little bit with uh, Miletus, right? The Apology. Then we did the Credo. And how many people were there in that? It's kind of a trick question. How many voices? Three, right. And so... Credo, Socrates, and the laws. the laws. Very good. And, and Socrates, you know, it's kind of a trick question because Socrates is being like a ventriloquist, isn't he? He's, he's saying the laws would say this. And then the Euthyphro, we're back to just two people talking. Um, now we got a whole bunch of people talking. So I thought it might be good to, to start with this just to introduce you to these characters so you have some idea of who's saying what. <coughs> Because one of the skills that I want you to have um, when reading these things is figuring out who's actually saying what, who's taking what position. It is easy to mix these, these, these different people up to get, you know, confused. Is, is Socrates talking here? Or is this Thrasymachus', Thrasymachus position? What is Socrates' actual position? So Socrates, I don't need to talk about him. You already know him, right? You've gotten to know him a little bit. Um, Cephalus is an old man, and all of this dialogue actually takes place at the house of Cephalus. He is the one who's hosting the party. Um, he talks a little bit at the very start with Socrates. He says, Socrates, you never come to visit me anymore. And Socrates and him get into a discussion about you know, old age and is old age good or bad. Uh, and then as soon as Socrates raises the key question for the whole book, the whole of the Republic, Cephalus um, does the prudent thing, and he says, well, I think i got to go and check on the dinner. Or, you know, he actually just says, I'm going to go and leave the, 
leave this stuff to you. And he says, Paul Marcus, you inherit the argument. Who's Paul Marcus? That's his son. And Clytophon is his, his other son. Clytophon doesn't talk much. Paul Marcus does. Not so much in, in this, this book, though. Um, and then we have Glaucon, who Socrates is hanging out with, and Adamantus. Adamantus and Glaucon are, are brothers, too. Um, so Socrates is kind of a middle-aged man. These are all young men. These are those young men that Socrates is corrupting, who are learning how to argue from him, who are picking up on his example. Um, some of these are, are mentioned obliquely in the Apology. You know, Socrates is saying, hey, if you think I'm screwing these kids up so badly, why don't you actually bring some of them up and take a look at them and see if they're any good? And if you read through the Republic, you will see that these are good young men. <laughs> They have their head on straight. Um, this guy is a different story, Thrasymachus. Thrasymachus is not from Athens. He is Thrasymachus of uh, Chalcedon, or Chalcedon, which is, I think it would be how it would be pronounced. Um, he is sort of a gun for hire, except he doesn't, doesn't fight with you know, swords or anything like that. He fights with words. He is what you call a sophist, one of these people who Socrates got confused with, who makes the worse argument appear the stronger, who teaches people how to argue well so as to win, and is not particularly concerned about what's true, or who's actually right, or anything like that. Um, you might think of like a debate coach. Were any of you on debate teams in high school? None of you? It was really interesting. I, I worked with the debate team a bit at, at FSU, and I found out that debate has nothing to do these days with right or wrong, or even who's got the better argument. They just learn how to do talking points and shoot them out quick, right? And then you listen to them, and you're like, wow, that doesn't even make any sense. Uh, but the judges sometimes get convinced. Thrasymachus would have been one of those people training them. And Thrasymachus has some very definite ideas about things, and he lets you know. He also has a, a um, you might say, a character or a way of presenting himself that replicates the position on justice that he's putting forward. So all of you who, who, read, the, who read the Republic, what's this guy like, this Thrasymachus guy? Pick some adjectives. Or we're now. You can you know, call him this or call him that. Yeah. He's rude, yeah. I mean, he says, you know, Socrates, you know, aren't you finished, you know, weaning from your wet nurse? She needs to wipe your, your you know, dripping nose. That's not very nice, is it? Would you say something like that to, to somebody that you're having a discussion with? At dinner? Across the table? Some people do. I've been at dinner parties like that. <coughs> what else? What else can you say about this guy? Based on what you remember from what you read. <coughs> yeah. Selfish? Yeah. What makes you say that he's selfish? Um, didn't he like, not want to have a conversation? He'd you... rather like, make a speech on his own and not talk to anyone? Okay, that's very good. He's selfish in, in one way, which is that he wants to do a monologue rather than dialogue. He wants to, like Socrates says, Thrasymachus, you know, poured this over us like somebody pouring water, a flood. And then, then he's ready to say, well, okay, I said my piece on it, I'm going to go. And you all know people like that. They want to tell you their opinion, and then when, when you want to talk about your, your own views, the uh, conversation is done. All right? That, that's selfish. Um... Is he selfish in any other ways? Yeah. Closed-minded. Closed-minded. That's interesting. How how is he closed-minded? Um, because he's kind of full of himself. He's full of himself. Yeah. I mean, he thinks that he knows, and that everyone else is is sort of stupid, or foolish, or, or weak. Yeah. Well, going on with what he said, he's kind of just like rude. Like he's not even like. There's no really other way to put it nicely. He's just an asshole. Like, yeah. 
He is he's he's an ass. Um, we you know we have all sorts of words for people like this. Um, you know one of the fancy words he's a boor. You know he's boorish, right? We don't use that word anymore. We use more um, ripe language to describe people like that. But it's the same idea, and people like that exist in every society, in every time. Um, it is an interesting case. I'll tell you another way he's selfish, too. You guys might not have picked up on it. He wants them to pay him to talk. He wants Socrates to pay him. So they're having a conversation. Now, I, I have actually pulled something like this um, out of desperation at, at times. Because when people find out that I teach philosophy, the first thing they want to do is tell me all about their philosophy. And then they want to you know, pick my brain and stuff like that. And they usually, sometimes they just want to argue. And I don't like to argue with people. So I started saying, you know, I don't give away product for free. I, uh, I, I get paid to do this, and you know, here's my hour, hourly rate, and I always quote something really high, and then they say, well, then I don't want to talk with you. And then they leave me alone, like on the plane or you know, the train or stuff like that. Usually I don't have to do that. But Thrasymachus is actually serious. He wants Socrates to pay him, and uh, Socrates ends up, you know, and this goes to your idea of selfishness, um, Socrates ends up saying, well, I don't have any money, but I'll give you some praise. I'll make you feel good. And Thrasymachus kind of grudgingly assents to that, doesn't he? That's kind of a jerky thing to do, too, isn't it? Um, to be at somebody else's house and say, I'm not going to talk to you guys until you pay me. Um, but it fits in with his philosophy, as we're going to see. What's really interesting about this guy is, despite what a jerk he is, after Socrates beats him, he sticks around through the rest of the Republic. He doesn't say anything. He seems to have changed his mind about his own views and behavior, and he's there to learn. Um, and we can explore that later some, some other time, but just keep that in the back of your mind. He's not all bad. But, you know, he is, there, there's something wrong with him, something wrong with his ideas. So let's look at some of that. But before we do that, um, there's somebody else to talk about. I'm not going to talk about Catholics. You guys read his arguments about old age. This is not something that you think about very much, right? Because um, you're all young. Um, I don't imagine that any of you have started you know, setting aside your retirement portfolio yet. Um, I have, but that's because I've been working on it for a while. And I'm, I'm middle-aged. I'm starting to look at that. Um, Arnold Schwarzenegger, this, this is kind of a tangent, but it kind of puts things in perspective. One of the reasons he wanted to come to America years and years and years ago was back in his country, in Austria, people your age, you know, moving into their, their 20s, were already starting to talk about their retirement. And he found that so incredibly boring. You know, he thought, what the hell kind of place is this? Where young people are, you know, like just looking way, way off into the horizon at this stuff that's not going to happen for years and years and they're not actually living their life now. Um, so it's not surprising to find out that you're not, you know, thinking about do I need wealth in old age, <coughs> do I need virtue in old age, but you can think about these things now. You know, in order for you to enjoy yourself now, uh, most of you don't have to worry about health. Um, like you will when you're old, but you do need money, don't you? Is money enough? You can have a really good time with money. Buy all sorts of things. It's fun to have money. You can shop, you can go to the bars, you know. It's kind of nice to go to a fancy restaurant and not have to worry about the cost. You know, or if you want to take a cab, take a cab. Um, what else? You can buy friends with money, right? For a while, until the money runs out. Um, is money enough? You guys already have, you know, wealth of experience. No, no pun intended with with that. You've you've seen people with money and how they behave. Does money make people particularly happy? No. It, it's it's good to have though. It's harder, it's harder to be happy without some sort of money, right? 
Why isn't it enough? This is what Catholic is getting at. Well, what else does he think he needs to have? Of course, he's at the end of his life. He's worried about the afterlife. You can be rich. Let's say you're towards the end of your life, and you got maybe five more years to live, and there is a heaven and a hell. Um, what do you start worrying about? Making more money? What do you start worrying about? Some people might even worry about that now. Yeah. Like the things you've done wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, by the time that you're 60, you've, you've done something wrong. Probably a whole bunch of things. You know? And you start to think about, yeah, the people you've hurt. Um, what's going to be waiting for you in the great beyond? And um, a lot of people are able to, you know, put those things off for a while, you know, drink it away or play it away or chat it away. But when you get closer and closer to the end, these things have a way of coming back up to haunt you, even on this side of the, the great mortal divide. Um, and people start worrying. Uh, they might even just worry, what's my legacy going to be or something like that. That's this worldly. But a lot of them start worrying about what's going to happen later on. What's that based on? You know, think about our, our sort of, you know, traditional schema here where we, you know, we're mostly monotheistic religions in this country. We tend to say there's a good place and a bad place. What gets you in the door? Lottery? All right, I'm not going to hell. I got the lucky number. Is that how it works? All that money can't buy you at the end. What gets you in the good place or sends you down to the bad place? Yeah. You are, are you good, your good deeds versus your bad deeds. Exactly. What you do and what the quality of what you do is. And if you do enough good deeds, you're a good person. If you do enough bad deeds, you become a bad person. Hell's for bad people. Heaven's for good people. There's a problem, you know, well, what if you're kind of in between, you know, there's a lot of questions about that, but let's assume it's pretty simple. Well, you know, that's something Catholics is concerned with. We're not that concerned with that, though, right now, right? Even I'm not. I'm only 41. So, I'll worry more about it when I'm 61. I do actually worry about it, but... Um, so, Catholics leaves, and Paul Marcus takes over, and Paul Marcus is going to try to answer this big question that Socrates is asking him. This is what the whole book of the Republic is about. What is justice? How do we know what is right and wrong? Do we have a definition for justice? It can't, it can't be something just like whatever makes me feel good, whatever makes me feel warm and fuzzy, right? That wouldn't be justice. That's what makes me feel good. That's something different. Um, so what is justice? There's a lot of answers to this. We're going to see a couple different answers just in this book of the Republic. And, and next class session, we're going to see another answer when we look at book four. Socrates is actually going to tell us what his position is. Here he's just, you know, mostly attacking other people's positions. Um, <coughs> Paul Marcus has sort of a traditional, you might even call it a common sense notion. You've all heard an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, right? Does that, I mean, is there something satisfying about that? Somebody hurts you, they deserve to be hurt, right? Justice is about deserving, you know, giving people what they deserve. Um, and we're going to look at some of the arguments that are, that are actually made here. How do you know what people deserve? Um, well, you know, they start out talking about cases that are really easy to think about. I give you 
something and I say, I want you to hold on to this for me, um, and when I want it back from you, please give it back to me. Maybe some money, or a weapon, or, I don't know, we can think of all sorts of things. Maybe some food, maybe a family member, you know, maybe my car, right? And if you give it back to me, that's paying what you owe. That's giving me back what you, you have for me, and you owe me, right? If I lend you some money, I expect that money to come back to me someday. And, you know, why do we charge interest on, on money? Do you, if you lend somebody money, do you feel like, you know, you ought to make it worth your while? Hope you do. Do any of you have bank accounts? Do you, do you tell the bank, I don't need the interest? They don't say that to you, do they? And they're saying they pay you a lot less interest than they will they'll charge you. Um, why is it okay for them to charge interest? Just because they can? Because we're using their service. Yeah, you're making use of somebody else's thing, so it makes sense. You know, if, if I let you use my field, to farm your crops, maybe you should give me some of your crops. Maybe that's what's fair. This is tied in with sort of a notion of fairness, too, isn't it? Um, you can think of it in other ways. Um, I bring in coffee one day. Um, you know, like I go to Starbucks and I get one of those big boxes of coffee and um, put it up here and I say, okay, anybody who wants coffee, come on up. Um, and let's say all of you like coffee, right? And I, I say, okay, um, let me pick some easy criteria. Tall people get two cups of coffee, short people get, get only one cup of coffee. Um, <laughs> arbitrary, isn't it? A little, a little arbitrary. So you get a, a, another cup of coffee. I think you qualify as tall, right? So you get another cup of coffee. Who else is tall? The rest of you don't. You would only get one cup of coffee. Is that fair? Sure. No, it is. Because you're tall. It's like you say it's fair. And I get and I get a, a, a two cups cooked too because I'm tall. And then I give myself an extra cup because I'm. <coughs> and then maybe another, I get another cup because I'm over forty and you're, you're all under forty. Um, so <laughs> for too long, I've got like ten cups of coffee and you one. Now that we've lost a sense of fairness along the way, haven't we? Um, giving people what they deserve, there has to be some sort of measure, doesn't there? Right? And so Paul Marcus is, is he's putting something out there that seems pretty commonsensical. It's something that we see in lots of different societies. Um, this makes some some sense. It jives with our experience, doesn't it? There are some problems with it, though. And here's where we get to the arguments. Socrates raises one big problem right off the bat. And you can think about this with anything like this. If I give you my gun, and I say to you, I want you to hold on to this gun for me. Um, I don't own any guns right, right, right now. I have before, but I don't, I don't currently. Um, I'm not anti-gun or anything. Um, and I, now I come to you in the middle of the night, and I look mad. And I say, you know, that SOB, I'm going to kill him. I need my gun. Now, is it right for you to give me the gun, or is it, is it wrong for you to give me the gun? I mean, what, what, is, what does justice say? You owe me that gun, don't you? See, some of you nodding your heads. Some of you are shaking your heads. Why, why are you shaking your head? Why, why, why wouldn't it be just for you to give me the gun? Go ahead. Because then you could do something drastic. It depends yeah. on like, what you know the person. Yeah, so maybe, maybe there could be cases where you shouldn't give the person back what, what they owe. Let's say you know that somebody's got a drug habit and you're their, their banker. Maybe you shouldn't give them their money back until <coughs> they get clean, you know. Um, let's say somebody has a prized record collection and they're in, a, they're in a terrible depressed state and they've lent it to you 
and you know they're going to break it because they get you know they get something out of destroying things when they're feeling bad. Hold on to it. But you notice this is one of those. It starts to get tough, doesn't it? It seems like well, on the one hand, it's just, and on the other hand, it's not just. This is where we get to something that we call a. Contradiction. When you have a contradiction, you're saying that something is the case, and at the same time, something isn't the case. And if you can take the same thing and say that it is this way and it's also not <coughs> this way, somewhere along the line you must have made a mistake. Think about mathematics. Mathematics is really simple this way. Um, if somewhere along the line you arrive at the result that 2 plus 2 equals 3, you made a mistake somewhere, right? Because 2 plus 2 isn't 3, it's what? Yeah. Thank goodness you all know that. <laughs> you know, nobody said 5. Nobody said 18, right? Um, in that case, there's a lot of different ways. Bless you. Where you can go wrong. Uh, either 2 plus 2 equals 4 or it doesn't equal 4. It can't be both at the same time. Uh, bless you. This, this code can't be both, um, I don't know how you describe it, bluish black maybe, and orange at the same time. Unless, of course, it had maybe stripes, right? But then it's a striped code. And, and you could still say about each part, each part, each stripe is either orange or it's blue. It, it can't be both. You might get, you know, you might say, well, yeah, but what if it's one of those kind of fabrics where it changes, you know, the way it looks in the light, you know, those holographic fabrics. Well, is it still, you know, it, it depends on whether you're looking at it this way or this way. And it's still not two different colors at the same time. Right? In the same place? So if you can get to the point which Socrates is trying to get to, where an action is both just and unjust, there must be some mistake along. That's why I'm bringing up contradiction here, because that's what's going to happen in these arguments. Holmarcus says, well, yeah, okay. So, yeah, I, I, I get what you're saying. Don't give the, the, the crazy person his gun or his sword or, you know, whatever he is going to do wrong with. But um, let's think about more common, you know, examples. What do you owe to people? And here it gets really interesting. So giving people what they owe, or what they deserve. Let's forget about like things that people have lent you or anything like that. What do you think people deserve? Respect. Respect, okay. Does everybody deserve respect? If. They respect you, you should respect them. Ah, but, like, see? <laughs> what if they don't respect you? It's harder. It's a lot harder to respect someone. That's a factual statement about our emotions. It is harder to respect somebody who doesn't respect us. Um, should you? Do you have a duty to respect them even if they don't respect you? Mm -hmm. What about Hitler? Should you respect Hitler if he shows up again? It's like the ultimate bad guy, you know? I mean, you could sub in a whole bunch of other people, you know. Um, Stalin was, was just as thoroughly evil as Hitler was, so was Mao Zedong. Um, so was Pol Pot, you know, you can rack up these, these people. Or even we just take, you know, sort of small grid serial killers, Jeffrey Dahmer, if he shows up. He's dead, but let's say he showed up again. Should you respect him? I mean, he didn't even respect himself. Certainly didn't respect his victims. He drilled holes into their heads trying to turn them into zombies. That's how he killed them. Uh, he was trying to make them into slaves. Um, for all sorts of terrible things. Horrible stuff. He's from my home, my home city, Milwaukee. That's why I know so much about him. Um, well, you know, that's a, that's a good question. Why is it harder to respect somebody who doesn't respect us? Because on some level we feel that they... They don't deserve it, right? Maybe they deserve something different. Paul Marcus talks about it in terms of friends and enemies. This is, you know, we don't often think of people as, as being our enemy. 
except you know maybe other countries or things like that. But all of you have friends and all of you have enemies. Um, what makes a person a friend? All of you have friends. There's probably different reasons why you're friends with this person as opposed to this person as opposed to this person. But in general, what can you say about your friends if they're, if they're actually your friends? Yeah. That they you. Yeah. There, there's certain behavioral requirements. They should behave <coughs> in certain ways to you. They may not always be nice. I mean, I, I, I've been friends with people where we, you know, um, call each other names and stuff like that, but it was all done in fun, right? Yeah, it's like when they're not serious about like being mean to you, like they're never like actually mean to you. Yeah, and I mean you can actually have relationships where that sort of fake meanness can seem really mean to people on the outside, but it can actually be something that brings people together. Um, so certain behavioral things, what should they feel towards you if they're really your friend? Okay, that's that's a good point. They they should be loyal, faithful. You should probably have some evidence of that. You know, you you get to be friends sometimes with people by going through situations where they get tested. Um, what else? Yeah. Um, they're there for you no matter what. Like you can go to talk to them about anything. Okay, that's very good too. They're they're, they're uh, open. Maybe they also keep your secrets, you know, they don't put them on, on their Facebook immediately. Someone's also told me that they are really, you know, obsessed with such and such. Um, I mean, yeah. Um, there's something else I'm trying to get at. How, did, how should they feel towards you? What should they desire for you? Yeah. Success. Yeah, and success is in the, in the, in the class of what? If you had to broaden it a bit. That's a good way to put it. They hope the best for you. They hope good things for you. They want you to prosper. They want you to feel, you know, safe. They want you to feel okay. They want good things for you. That's what makes them friends. What makes somebody an enemy is not just doing bad things to you. And somebody who talks behind your back, they're an enemy to you. You know? Um, why? Well, because they desire to harm you. Why do people talk about other people behind their back? They want to hurt them. Um, you know, the person who, who pushes you down, you know, uh, on the playground, they're an enemy too. They're just an open enemy. Um, somebody who talks to you all the time as if you're worth nothing. They're an enemy. They, they don't like you. They, they may even hate you. Right? That's an enemy. You, you actually do have enemies. We even have this, this word that got coined like ten years ago, frenemy. Um, it's a combination of a person who you think is a friend and so you keep them close to you, uh, but you, you also know you, you really can't trust them and they're, they're really your, your, uh, your enemy. They're really trying to undermine you. Um, okay, so what, what do you owe to friends? If they desire good things for you, you're not a very good friend if you don't desire that back, right? Yeah, I was going to say, if you return the favor, you know, for everything they provide. Yeah. You should be giving good things to friends. That's to be just. If you, if people treat you well, but you treat them poorly in return, Paul Marcus would say, you're a bad person. You're a user. <coughs> we know people like that. They don't stay friends with people for very long. Um, what should you give to your enemies? Should you give them good things? Should you give, uh, this is a poll mark, it's not, not what you feel in your heart of hearts. Should you give them respect? No, you should try to kill them if you can. That's what they deserve. You should burn their houses and, you know, um, drive them out of town and undermine their businesses and do whatever you can to them because they're enemies. 
You know, you should give them bad things or evil. Um, now, there's there's two real problems with this that Socrates brings up. This is a very attractive viewpoint, isn't it? This this makes sense. I mean, we may not want to cop to it. We may we may want to think of ourselves as as being nice, to this, but this is this actually does make sense to a lot of people in, in every society. Um, there's one big problem, though. Are we always correct in our assessments about who our friends and who our enemies actually are? Think about your own experience. How many of you have been screwed over by, by somebody at one point in time? Okay. So you've had the experience of thinking that somebody was your friend and they turned out to be your enemy, right? Have you ever had the other experience where you, you didn't get along with somebody and you thought they were, they were just, you know, scum? And then after a while you come to realize, hey, I kind of like this person. And that's, there's not something wrong with me because I like this person. I've actually just come to realize their, their good qualities. <coughs> Have you had that happen to you? Yeah. Um, we make movies about this, don't we? You know, the, the two... Warriors from you know different civilizations stranded on the desert island, and they find they have to work together, and they actually turn out to be very similar. You know, this one's got a family back home. This one's got a family back home. Well, they that tells them they can actually be friends. They can trust each other. Um, now, let's go a little bit further with this. Think back to that example where you got screwed over. Um, you were probably giving that person good things, right? That was the right thing for you to do, in one sense, except for the fact that they were actually your enemy. So what should you have been doing with them? Should have been giving them bad things. So you should have been giving them good things and bad things at the same time. We've got a contradiction there. The problem is we don't actually know all the time who is actually good and who's actually bad. Sometimes we are friends with people who are really bad, <clears throat> you know. Some, you know, one of the things that you have to go through in your life, probably many times, is cutting people off and saying, "I'm done with this person." You know, they're they're no good for me. They're toxic. They're uh, actually an enemy. So that's one problem with this. The other problem that Socrates raises, and maybe this goes to this notion of giving everybody respect. Um, if we, if you actually do harm your enemies. Are you making them better or are you making them worse than harming them as a human being? Put aside any ideas that they might learn their lesson. Because, you know, there could be a good point to punishment. <coughs> punishment is when you inflict some bad thing on somebody, but it's to try to make them better. But if you're just, you know, attacking your enemy, are you making them a better person? Probably making them worse, right? Making them more angry, more hateful, giving them more reason to, you know, fume off by themselves. So, could it really be justice for you to damage another person? Is that what the just person is really going to do? Socrates is asking this. I think that your position is very similar to Socrates' position, that you should show everybody respect. Socrates would actually say that. Um, Pretty tough to do, though, isn't it, with some people? Emotionally, isn't it? So this is, this is, these are some problems with this position. Let's go on to Thrasymachus. So what does Thrasymachus say justice is? He's much more radical. He says all that nonsense about friends and that sort of stuff, forget that. What is justice? You remember the formula that he, he keeps saying over and over again? It's the interest of who? Do you remember? The interest or what's good for? The stronger, exactly. So, justice is the interest of who? 
now be stronger. And Socrates then screws with him a little bit and says, what do you mean? You mean the biggest guy in the room? The one who can, say, eat the most meat? The one who can carry the most? It's their interest? And Thrasymachus, you know, this is where he starts to get kind of cocky, isn't it? He says, you know, that is not what I'm talking about at all. And you know it. What I mean is that the people who are in charge, the, who's the stronger? The rulers. The rulers impose their will on what we call subjects, and those are the weaker. So, you know, the cop, the cop has the gun, the cop has the billy club, and the cop can haul you into jail. The cop gets to decide what counts as right and wrong, not you. When you have your own, you know, billy club and gun and and, you know, your own legal system behind you, then you get to do it, right? Then you get to be stronger. In a relationship, um, we can think about this not necessarily in terms of governments or things like that, like Thrasymachus does. You, uh, some of you, uh, I'm, I'm probably sure, had some parents um, that were very um, caring and rational, and probably some of you had parents who said, it's my way or the highway. And, you know, when you have your own house, you can make your own rules, but I'm in charge, and so you're going to live by my rules. That's the interest of the stronger. And you, and you probably said, that sucks. That's, you know, BS. This, this isn't fair. And so well, I don't care what's fair. I'll tell you what's fair. That's, they get to decide what justice is. They get to decide what, what counts as that, and you notice it always does line up in these sort of cases with the interests of the stronger. It's what works out well for them. You don't get to play your music real loud when they have to, you know, go to work or want to watch TV. That sucks. I should get to listen to it. It really matters to me. I, I remember going through this when I was a kid. Back then it was boom boxes, you know. And um, you get in trouble. And, and you could say, well, you know, I should get my time to listen to stuff, too. You listen to your TV and it's real loud. Um, or, you know, why, why do we have to go to bed when you want to go to bed? Because they're the stronger. They're in charge. They call the shots. How come you get to drink and I don't get to drink? Well, could, you know, they'd say, well, first of all, you're not 21. But then they'd say, because it's my house and I bought the, the stuff. I get to drink it, not you. You know, uh, the interests of the stronger. What about in in relationships when you're, you know, with with somebody who you think you're, you're equal with? Do people ever dominate each other? Friends or uh, you know, in, in dating relationships? You've seen it, right? Um, bullying is a good example of this. Um, Abusive relationships are a good example of this. Okay. So, you know, you, you can see this happen in a lot of cases, and they get to decide what counts as right, as just, as, as good. The stronger get to dominate, and they get to push their values and their views onto the weaker. And oftentimes people will say stuff like, well, that's the way of the world, or, you know, that's just the way it goes, or life isn't fair. Um, they're endorsing a view sort of like this, where they say, might makes right. You all heard that one, right? Those who have power get to use it on those who don't. And if you don't like it, what should you do? If you don't like being dominated, being pushed around by other people, what should you do? Stand up for yourself. Yeah, what is, what is that going to mean effectively, though? Just you push them away and they're never going to bother you again? No, you got to push them down. you got to become powerful yourself. If you don't want other people to impose their values on you, become so powerful that you can impose your values on other people. Because that's the real test for power, with this sort of mentality. Now there's, I mean, how many of you like this? Nobody wants to cop to that. There's always, you know, a few people who, who like this. Um, 
How many of you really don't like this? Not a lot of feelings that way either. You, you're, you're okay with people dominating you and, and pushing their values on you and not giving you a chance to grow and develop your own? Really? I, I doubt it. I bet you don't feel too good when people do that to you. Um, but that's feelings. Can we think of any reasons why this can't actually be the right way? Well, that's what Socrates is going to give us. He's going to give us reasons. So let, let's actually um, look at some of these, these arguments. These are actually on the handout that I have put into iLearn for you. So you can, you know, if, you, if you don't get them quite right now, they're there for you uh, in sort of a chart form. So, if this is justice, then the right thing to do for those who don't have power would be what? Not rise up, because that's, <coughs> that's not going to help out. <coughs> the, the powerful make the rules. Your little people, what should you do? What makes a good person in that case? got rules in place. They may not actually be, you know, the best rules, but they're rules. What makes you a good person then? What makes you a bad person? You break the rules. Yeah. So if, if what makes you the bad person is you break the rules, then what makes you a good person? Follow. Follow the rules. And the rules may not make sense because, you know, some powerful person just made them. Maybe, maybe the powerful person is, is screwed up. We don't know. Definitely they made the rules to favor them. So if, if the powerful person says, um, we don't like philosophers, everybody should get together you know, once a day and um, hate philosophers. You guys remember, did any of you read 1984? Bless you. Um, in high school or middle school, that book 1984 by George Orwell. So a few of you, there, it's this totalitarian society. It's what you call a dystopia. It's a bad place. And the people who are in charge are really powerful. They, they manipulate all sorts of things behind the scene. And they have a, um, a thing each day. And I don't remember what it's called. It's like a hate session or, you know, a hate party. And they get together and they flash images of these people on the screen. And you're supposed to hate them and shout at them. And this solidifies their their power. Um, imagine we did this with, with race, or we did this with nationality. Let's say the rulers really liked that. Um, they, they wanted us to, I mean, who, who should we pick on? I mean, we, we're kind of a tough society with that because we've got all these different races and nationalities. Um, it would be hard to, you know, not um, transgress against somebody. Um, I don't know. Well, China's our, our big strategic enemy, right? The rest of your lifetime, you're going to be hearing a lot about China because they're rising and we're sort of sitting still and they're going to be the next superpower. Um, maybe we should hate the Chinese. Maybe we will have leaders who say, everybody here better start hating Chinese. Uh, if you're Chinese, then that poses some problems for you, right? Maybe then you just dissociate and say, I'm, I'm one of the good Chinese, I'm not one of the bad Chinese. Well, if that's the case, then doing what the rulers say, even though this seems kind of screwy to us, that becomes the good thing to do. Um, it serves the ruler's interest, doesn't it? And, you know, a, a, a solidified society. Um, here's a problem, though. What if the rulers don't actually know what's good for them? What happens then? Let's say one of us sets up society and sets up the rules of right and wrong. And, well, you know, if you put me in charge, you shouldn't. Because I, I'd, I'd make some dumb mistakes. You know, I'm smart enough to know that I would make those mistakes. Because I actually have been in charge of some things, you know, 
I made dumb mistakes when I was in charge of those, occasionally. Um, you know, I would be tempted to, if you gave me absolute power, I would be tempted to use that power just to further my own interests and, and screw over other people. <clears throat> that probably wouldn't be good for me. I would probably be fatter than I currently am, you know, because um, I wouldn't have any incentive to try to get back in shape or diet or anything like that. And, you know, I'd be eating the sort of stuff that they make over at the culinary all the time. Um, really rich desserts and stuff like that. Now, if I made the rules so that all of you are supposed to, you know, just give me as much pleasure as possible in my life, and I'm in charge, that would in one way be the right thing for you to do, right? Because I'm commanding it. But would it really be in my interest? This is what has happened a lot of times throughout history. Um, so you'd have a contradiction there. You'd be doing one action, and it would be both right and wrong at the same time. Now, Thrasymachus gets around this. He says, you know, I'm not talking about that sort of case. I'm talking about where the rulers actually know what they're doing, where they're good rulers in the sense of they're, they're following what ruling is about. They don't make stupid mistakes, um, like, you know, pursuing pleasure or, um, you know, killing all their enemies or, or things like that. This is where Socrates comes up with an interesting idea. And I'll put it over here instead. So this is Socrates. If you think about <coughs> medicine, or piloting a boat, or anything you like, anything that has some sort of skill, um, what does that skill aim at? It's different things, right? Medicine aims at, what's the goal for medicine? Curing diseases, and when, when the diseases have been cured, we have a state of that we call health, health very good, as, as opposed to sickness. Um, when you're piloting a boat, don't crash on the rocks, right? You're a good pilot if you don't crash. You're a bad pilot if you, if you do. Um, just like if you're a bad doctor, the patient, patients tend to die. If you're a good doctor, they <laughs> tend to get better, right? Um, and you can think of all sorts of cases like this. All of you are going to major in something, right? All of you, presumably, are going to have some sort of skill by the time that you get out of here. And hopefully you're actually good at that. Because <laughs> um, if you're not, then your clients are going to be kind of irritated with you when they you know, want you to do this and, and you, you screw it up. right? You want your clients to be happy with you. Um, what, do, what do these skills aim after? They all aim after a certain kind of good, a certain kind of what he calls perfection. So, you know, the medicine, the doctor, they try to heal you. They try to make you healthy. Now, the skill tells the, what we'll call the practitioner, what to do. So, are, are any of you considering medicine? You're like pre-med? One, two, three? Okay. Um, Anybody going into uh, business, like finance, marketing, management? There's one person? Okay. Um, what else is big here? Criminal justice? Anybody going into criminal justice? Okay. Uh, psychology, sociology, things like that. Um, all of these have things that they're about. All of these have goals. All of these have skills. You know, criminal justice? Keep the prisoners actually in the prison until they're ready to come out. That's a pretty basic goal. If it doesn't happen, we're all in a lot of trouble. Uh, keep the patients alive. Um, you know, manage the money supply. <laughs> Build good businesses. These are all important things. And the skill tells the practitioner what to do, doesn't it? Any, do you trust anybody who says, I'm going to do doctoring based on my own ideas? I've got this system. You ever hear anybody start, whenever somebody starts out a conversation with, I've got this system that I came up with. Run. Because <laughs> it's probably going to be bad for you. 
for every like you know one <clears throat> one person who actually has a good working system that they came up with on their own that actually turns out to be true and work and all that, there's a million kooks. And uh, if you put your money with them, or you put your health in their hands, or you put your relationship in their hands, like think about anyone who's going into psychiatry or, or, or um, psychology, you're, you're also about healing people, but their psyche is telling them how to manage their lives. You want to have an actual skill telling the practitioners what to do. And then what do the practitioners do? They work on the, the ordinary person. And the skill is actually, in some way, the stronger compared to the practitioner who's weaker, isn't it? They're telling the practitioner what to do. The skill never fails. The practitioner may fail. And the practitioner is stronger than the person that they're dealing with is, aren't they? Every once in a while, I go to the doctor's office and they they tell me I have high blood pressure. It's usually because I drank like two two pots of coffee and you know didn't eat anything that day. And then I explain that to them, and they say, "Yeah, we've heard all those excuses before. A whole bunch of people come in here and tell us those those sort of stories. Um, we're going to check your blood pressure daily. This has happened to me a couple times. You know, I'd go in for like you know <clears throat> I've got a sinus infection. They're going to check your blood pressure because they always do." Now you're on their radar, and they're in charge, aren't they? If you don't do what your doctor tells you, you're in trouble. You know? Um, you're, you're stuck. Think of, or we could think about prisons, right? I mean, there are prisons that are actually run well, where they're trying to make the prisoners into people who you can let out and not have to worry about. Who's in charge there? It's not the prisoners, it's the guards, the administration. Now, here's the question that you should ask in terms of Thrasymachus. Thrasymachus is saying that this is set up just so that these people can exploit these people. Is that how it really works? <coughs> let's, let's think about some professions. Are there any doctors who exploit their patients? You read stories about them every once in a while, don't you? Can you think of any ways doctors exploit their patients sometimes? By like turning them into an experiment. Oh, that's a big one. Yeah, without their consent. Um, I mean, there were terrible things that were done to people years ago, and are probably still being done in other countries. Um, you know, injecting them with, with diseases just to see what would happen. You know. That's somebody exploiting somebody else. What else? Can you think of any other cases? Yeah. Sometimes doctors try to sell their practice and like try and sell patient stuff that they don't really need. Yeah, that's another good point. Um, I had a friend who was a doctor, and I was looking for another job. I was thinking about changing my profession. I, I'd always see these drug reps going in and out of his office, and so I asked him, <clears throat> "What would it take for me to be a drug rep? Would I need like a degree in chemistry or?" Um, pharmacy or something like that. He says, nah, you don't need anything like that. You just got to be a salesman. They'll send you to seminars, and um, you know you learn about that drug that you're <coughs> representing. And that's why I don't buy anything from these people because they don't know anything. You know, they'll take you to they'll, they'll take the doctors out and wine them and dine them, and take them to all these nice vacation spots. And then what's the doctor supposed to do in return? Prescribe that drug. And the reps, unfortunately, this is why my friend who was a doctor didn't like them, used to be that, that if you had like a chemistry person or a pharmacy person or a biology person, they would, they would have that drug and they could tell you what it would interact with. These people who are doing drug, drug repping now, they'd have, they have no idea. So he'd ask them, well, can I prescribe this with this? Well, yeah, I suppose. Why not? <laughs> and you know what that leads to. So, uh, <laughs> Maybe your doctor is prescribing you whatever drug they are, not because it's really good, <laughs> but because they're getting a kickback. There, there are cases. Kind of a sure, yeah. There are cases where, where people do exploit each other based on their, you know, standing that they have. Politicians do this, right? We, all, we can all think of corruption. 
politicians that, you know, give favors to the people that, that do favors for them, that treat the ordinary person pretty poorly. We've all seen that sort of thing happen. But here's the question that you've got to ask. Through some is saying, hey, that's the way it is. That's the way it ought to be. Socrates is saying, hey, if you're actually being guided by this profession, think about doctors again. If you're really following the rules of your profession, would you prescribe a drug that you, you are just getting paid money to prescribe? That a drug company is um, taking you out to dinner and giving you hotel rooms to prescribe? Is that what your, what your skill would tell you to do? Yes or no? No. You would be following what the skill demands and you wouldn't be exploiting the people who are weaker. You're, if you're actually following your skill, you're working for those people. You are trying to help them out. You're working for their interest, not the interest of the stronger, the interest of the weaker. Now here's the question you, you have to ask yourself. With medicine, okay, it's real easy, right? Medicine's all about healing. What's the purpose of ruling, of governing? We just had a, an election over in in uh, Ulster County. I don't know if you guys have one over here in Dutchess County. Why do we go to the polls and elect people? Just for fun? Do we like the way they look? Yeah. So you can elect someone who best uh, reflects your personal views? Okay, the, the reflecting your personal views. Um, you just have like, you know, crazy views or, you know, they're not tied to what's good or what's bad. What are, what are your personal views about? They're about your Interest. interests. What's good for you? Or also, you, you know, I mean, you might not be so selfish to only care about what's good for you. You might care about what's good for mom and dad, brother and sister, you know, widen it a bit, your friends, your community. You might care about the interests of other people. And so the art of ruling, the skill of ruling, would be about doing what's good for the community. Now, if a ruler really is ruling that way, then are they just dominating people and exploiting them and setting things up for their own interests? We all know people that, that do that sometimes. They do set things up just to benefit themselves.